Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, we have been working through a series through the book of Second Peter called Last Words. And it's called this because we believe these are some of the last words that Peter wrote shortly before his death. And so he is kind of giving a farewell address to uh, these collection of churches he had built a relationship with in the province of Asia Minor. And so I want to start by kind of telling you a little bit of something about myself. I, I'm kind of a, I'm a bit of a people pleaser. Like not in the sense of like, I, would just, I just want to make everyone happy, like I do, but I also want to see everybody get along. Like it really bothers me when people don't get along. It makes me sad. And so I want to try and find like the middle ground where people can get along and be nice to each other and be kind. And it becomes really difficult for me, especially in the current cultural climate we have right now, where we have two very opposing sides on basically anything and everything that it almost feels like you can't say anything of your opinion without it being attacked in some way. So it really bothers me, makes me feel nervous. But at the same time, there's also this thing where it's like, I really want to know who it is that I can listen to and understand and, and trust that they're giving a accurate opinion or description of things. Because I have people on a lot of different sides of different arguments that I, I trust and I agree with and I like and I appreciate them. And so it's, it's, it starts to become, where do we find the middle ground? Where do we, where, how do we do this? And so how do I know certain people are the right people to listen to? Who has the right interpretation of events that are going on? And who are the right teachers that I can be listening to and trust in to know that they would be teaching me an accurate description of Jesus so that I am not led astray and led into a path away from Jesus. That is something I simply don't want to do. So it's essential for us to be able to identify and know who these right voices are, what they are teaching, so that we can stay in a path that is heading towards Jesus and not away from him. So over the next two weeks, we're actually going to look at Peter's perspective on false teachers, because there were these false teachers that had come into these churches that he was, had built this relationship with, and so he was coming at them, and he's going to be very, very blunt. I'm just going to be honest with you. This is a hard passage in that way where he's going to be very blunt and very straightforward about what he thinks, but I'll help you understand about why it's right for him to think this way and why some of these things are kind of good that he's doing these things as well. So he's addressing these false teachers. And so today what we're going to look at, we're going to look at three facts that Peter gives us about where the power uh, comes for false teachers and what will result from their rebelliousness in continuing to teach these things. So here's our main point that we're going to cover this morning is that the false teacher's power comes from teaching what people want to hear and the deception of Satan, but God's judgment on them will come soon and God will keep his people from falling away from him. So I invite you now to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10a. If you do not have a Bible with you, I invite you to pull out the brown hardcover back Bible that's in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 1226. And let me just give us again another reminder about the background of this book, that this was written by Peter, writing to these collection of churches in Asia Minor, like I already said. Uh, he is trying to bring order back into these churches because of the influence of these false teachers that were coming in. The false teachers were teaching things like that Jesus will never return, that that is a, not a true thing that's going to happen, and that because of the fact that Jesus isn't going to return, then people are free to live however they want because there's no coming judgment. And so Peter bases his argument on why this isn't true on the fact of who Jesus is, what he has done, and how Peter knows who Jesus really is because of the fact that he saw him transfigured before him in all of his glory. So he is the son of God. He is God in flesh. And so Peter got what he believes from Jesus, not just from some person out there. He got it from Jesus himself and that God has given us everything we need in order to follow him in the midst of this crazy and dark world that we live in. I want to make sure I clarify something before I continue about when, when we talk about the word judgment, because this is a loaded word in our culture, because sometimes people think you might be being judgy on them. And what they mean by that is that you're starting to kind of elevate yourself as if you are a better or more important person because you don't do certain things that other people do. But this is not the case when it comes to what the Bible talks about with judgment. It's very much in the judicial sense of a judge making accurate assertions on what has what is morally wrong and what is morally right. And so when we 
take God's judgments. We can have God's accurate judgments, but we need to anchor it in the idea of God's ultimate judgment was to actually come and be human, come in human flesh, die on the cross for our sins, take all of the, our sin upon him, pay the price for our sins so that we could have a new life in him if we believe. That is where God's justice is filtered through, is through the cross. And so this isn't giving us permission to put people down for believing wrong things, but to say that these are wrong things because it leads and distracts people away from Jesus, and we don't want to see that happen. We want to see people know Christ, and so we want these false teachings to be dealt with and taken care of so that people can come to know the real Jesus. So let's begin verse 1 of chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. The condemnation, their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping." So Peter makes a connection. He goes back to Old Testament Israel and that there were false prophets that had come in claiming that they were from God, speaking God's word, but they weren't actually doing that. They were speaking from their own. They weren't speaking accurate things. And so Peter says, and so we should expect that there would be false teachers in the church trying to distract and that this is a normal pattern of things. Even Jesus predicted that this would happen in the gospel of Matthew chapter seven. This is a, this is a part and parcel of, of the life that we live, that there are going to be these false teachers that come around. And so Peter kind of gives their MO, like how they're going to act. He says they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, meaning they're going to kind of give the veneer and appearance that they are true followers of Jesus. And what they're going to do is they're going to come in and they are going to present themselves as if they are legit followers of Jesus. But then as they kind of get in and infiltrated into the rest of the church, then they will start teaching and spreading these ideas that are, he says, they're destructive, first of all. And what he means by destructive is that it will lead people away from Jesus so that they will spend eternity away from him. And so that's why they're destructive because they're not just simply some, some guy's random opinion, but they actually will lead people astray. And he calls them heresies. It's very important for us to understand this word heresy because it's kind of tossed around a lot in Christian circles sometimes. And what it really means is it's a, anything that is a distortion of the gospel, of the faith that Jesus gave to the apostles that they now passed on to all of us through the word of God. And so anything that distorts that or changes it is what we would call a heresy. So let me give you an example of a heresy in our day. Uh, we, it, it's often called the prosperity gospel. And so let me kind of tell you how this one works. The prosperity gospel is basically this idea that a follower of Christ should be all, should always be healthy, should always be wealthy, and always be prosperous in everything that they do, and all they have to do to access that is simply claim it in the name of Jesus, and it will be theirs. All they need to have is more faith and God will give them all of those things. So if you want to have, you know, you want to have a million dollars come on your doorstep, you just need to have more faith and pray for it to come, okay? This is extremely destructive for a couple of reasons. One, it's flat out not true. I think any of us have had experience with this. And so they'll use this phrase where they'll say, uh, where Jesus even said, you can ask anything uh, in my name and it will be given to you. And so that, that's totally distorting that idea and messes with it. And what it's really, what the Christian life really isn't about, isn't about the accumulation of things and things that we might want, but it's actually just a surrender of our life to say, my life is yours, God, and you do with it what you want. That's, not, that's what Christianity, when you boil it down, really is. It's this surrender of our lives. It's not a using God as sort of a, a, a trick to be able to get things that we want. And so this is a very destructive belief because it can really damage people. There can be people who are struggling in poverty that are told this idea. And I've heard this story before that they watched some prosperity gospel preacher on TV and he said, plant a seed of faith, send me $1,000 and God will reap a benefit for you. 
And that, no joke, this preacher sent back a $1 bill to this family that had sent this check in and that nothing ever happened. They never received more blessing upon that. That is not how this works. So you see that it is corrupt and it's wicked. And so these false teachers are gonna come in teaching these kind of destructive heresies that they're gonna look like Christians. And he says, even when he says this phrase, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, it's about perspective. It's what these people look like Christians. They, don't, they aren't necessarily Christians, but they are denying Jesus. So that it's not that people will lose their salvation, it's that they are giving the appearance that they were Christians and now they are walking away from it. And when he uses that word bought, it's one of the, I think it's one of the most beautiful phrases when we talk about the gospel, that we once were slaves in our sin and Jesus bought us, purchased us out of our sin so that we could be freed from the wickedness and evil and sin and even the things that entangle us, the things that hold us back. Jesus would free us from those. He has bought us with a price, bought us with his life so that we would be his followers, his servants, and that he would be our Lord and our King. And it's this beautiful idea, but it's, again, it's this appearance that they look, these false teachers looked like they were true followers of Christ. And he says that, the, that they are bringing swift destruction on themselves. It's not this phrase that like once they start teaching, God all of a sudden is gonna smite them and they're struck with lightning out of nowhere. What this means is their destruction is coming. It will be sudden. It will be sort of somewhat in a way a surprise to them that they don't know that it's coming, but it is absolutely coming because of the fact that they are teaching these heresies. And so he says, many will follow their depraved conduct. That depraved conduct is more literally translated shameful ways, and it's usually a term for sexual sin, okay? These kind of gross and nasty things that people would get into, and they're saying many people will follow because the human heart sometimes will, if they're given the opportunity and the freedom to pursue things that they feel that they want inside, the human heart will We'll go for it. And so many people will follow them because they're being told that you can go for these things. You can have these things because, even because you are free in Christ to go and do it. That's what these false teachers were saying. But as a result, what happens is this brings the way of truth into disrepute. What Peter means by that is that people will look at Christians who, who say, or people who say they're Christians who are living in this way, and they will look at them and, and people will go, wow. They're living in some really nasty, like why, why would I want to give my life to Jesus if they're just living like the rest of the world does? What's the difference? What's the point? And so it brings down the reputation of Christians and that is not what we want to do. Peter gives kind of their motivation here. He says it's in their greed, their desire for accumulating things, to take things for themselves, that these teachers will exploit people. And what he means by exploiting is that basically, it's this idea that they, these false teachers are marketing defective goods for their own advantage, whether it's for financial purposes or for their own pleasures. They are seeking to exploit people and do things in a really awful way in order to get what they want. But he says this with fabricated stories. He's now turning it on the head, the accusation that they threw at him and the apostles that they were making up the stories about Jesus and he proves them wrong by saying, I saw Jesus, I saw what he did, I saw who he is, this is true, I heard what he gave me, this is the truth. So he's flipping it and when we say, like for me, sometimes when we see the phrase like this where Peter kind of flips it, it kind of becomes a game of he said, she said. So how do we know that what Peter said was true? Well, first of all, you've got to consider the source. He got it from Jesus, who not only said he was the son of God, he kind of called his shot and rose from the dead, predicting it that he would rise from the dead. I think you want to listen to someone who said that, who said they were going to rise from the dead, and they did, okay? So that's where, and you see, but you also see the difference in life change. The people who believe these things about the gospel, believe these things about Jesus, about from what Peter taught, there is true, amazing life change that happens, and that should be an amazing evidence of the truth of the gospel versus living like the rest of the world, like the false teachers would say, is perfectly okay to do. And so Peter says that their condemnation has long been hanging over them. It's been planned for a long time, and it's coming. And, he's, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Basically, God's not ignoring this situation. God's not sleeping on it. He's going to act, but it's going to be in time. And we'll talk about that in a minute in the next section of verses. But I wanna, want us to look at what our first fact is this morning, is that a false teacher's power 
comes from the deceptive powers of the evil one and by permitting immorality. What's kind of implied within Peter's words here is where the source of some of these uh, teachings come from. Because listen to this, this is what Paul says in Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So he's saying, Paul is basically saying in some ways, and in using Peter's example here, that the false teachers, it's not necessarily about those particular people, but about the spiritual powers that are behind them that are deceiving those teachers and, use, and then using what they teach to deceive others. So the real battle is in the spiritual realm. So as a result, us Christians, what we need to do, as Paul says, is put on the full armor of God, or to use Peter's terms, he said, to add godly qualities to our lives, that we would believe in Jesus, recognizing, and this is all from chapter one of this book, that we have been given everything we need to live a godly life. And that now, as a result of that, we need to pursue God, add godly qualities to our life, that we can become more like him. And when we do that, Peter says this, we will never stumble. We will never fall away. So it's really important that we understand this and that we begin to start to recognize where Satan's at work, seeing what he's trying to do to deceive people, to pull them astray, to pull them away from the truth of what Jesus has done and who he really is. And these can't be just things where we try and ignore it and hope it goes away because it, there's huge things at stake here. We're talking life and death, salvation and judgment. These are huge things and we need to address them. And we also need to recognize that some of this immorality that is was being allowed by these false teachers and permitted is just not the way of the Christian life. Really, the Christian life is more about saying no to certain things, knowing where it could lead us, and that sometimes it could get kind of awkward where we, we're going to have to say no to things that we truly might want or that other people are going with, and they might not necessarily be wicked or evil, but just that we are trying to live lives of self-control and pursuing God instead of pursuing things of the world. And so I want to give you guys a quick test. So this is actually would be a good opportunity to pull out your phones and take a picture because I'm going to go over these really quick, but five tests in order to test for false teaching. So if number one is a test of origin. Does it come from man or does it come from God? Is it something that someone made up on their own or do they say that God is the one who gave this to them? And you'll have false teachers, they'll come around, they'll say, this is from God, God spoke to me. You'll see that with prosperity gospels, they'll tell you that God said this to them about these things. Okay, but that's why we have five tests, not just one. The test of authority, does it come from the man or does, does it come from man or does it come from the Bible? And again, false teachers will take stuff from the Bible, they'll twist it, but we take all of these tests together. So does it come from the Bible? But is it consistent? So test of consistency, does it fit with the rest of scripture? And again, going back to that prosperity gospel, here's where this doesn't work, why this doesn't fit with the rest of scripture. Because some of the most faithful men who were able to tell people that they couldn't be dead anymore or people weren't sick anymore, people had to uh, be healed. The apostles, they had some great faith, but they were living in fear constantly. They weren't wealthy. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. So they lived a life that truly was not the poster child of what this prosperity gospel is all about. But does it, and then the next one, a test of spiritual growth. Does it help people to grow? Test of godly living. Does it lead people to better live a godly life? When you take all of those together and you can't say yes to all of them for something that is being taught, then that's where you might need to say, yes, that's a false teaching. I'm gonna stay away from that and not listen to that teacher because I wanna make sure that I'm following the way of Jesus because it leads to life. It's not, again, not a judgy thing, but it's a, a statement of, I want to follow Jesus. Let's continue, verse four. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. So what Peter is gonna do here, he's, he's pulling out what, what we call these if-then statements. Basically, if this is something that God has done before, then he will do it 
again. And he gives three examples. And, he gives, and he's basically saying through all of these that, there's, that God is going to bring about this judgment, that yes, God maybe waited for a time, but he brought it about when there was wickedness and there was evil. First example he gives is in verse four, talking about these angels who sinned. And this is actually one of the most confusing passages in this letter, if not one of the most confusing passages in all of the Bible, because it connects to another super confusing passage in Genesis chapter six, where it says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them that they chose. And so here's my opinion on it. Now hear this, my opinion, okay? This is not, I don't call this the absolute truth. But here's what I think was going on here. Is there, were the, there was this line of this man named Seth who came from Adam and Eve. And there was a line of people from Cain who was another son of Adam and Eve, but he had killed his brother. And so they were not supposed to intermingle and marry because God wants to keep his people focused on him and that when they intermingle, it can distract and move people away from following God. And so what happened is I think these angels came in and were starting to uh, either, there's a couple different things. They were either possessing these sons of God, these fallen angels, and having them go and sleep with the daughters of men and get, and married, get married to them, or that they were so heavily influencing them that this made God you know, to this level of angry that he sends them to hell. Very confusing passage, but that's my basic opinion on this, of what's going on here. But what's clear is that God brought about judgment on these angels for their activity and what they did, and he sends them to hell. Now, the typical word for hell in Greek is this word Gehenna. But in this story, or in this writing, it's Peter uses the word Tartarus. It's a Greek term, which, which literally is... Uh, it's lower than even Hades. Like it's for the worst of the worst of people. So this is where, this is Peter kind of emphasizing his point. This is how bad it is. Not that there's levels of hell, but that this is how upset God was about this whole thing. And he put them in gloomy dungeons is what chains of darkness means and that they are confined and restrained because of their sin, because of what they did. Then he goes to his next example to talk about Noah and the ark, which is a famous story, but it's also a scary story. We often put it up in children's wings, but it's a scary story because it's about God's judgment on wicked people. And so God didn't spare them because look at this. He says he protected Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness. God didn't spare these people because likely over a time, it, you know, we believe that uh, Noah took, it took Noah about 100 years to probably build the ark think that would give some plenty of, plenty of opportunities for people to ask questions of, Noah, why are you building this massive boat for no reason to them? And he would say, because there is co they're coming judgment. There is a coming flood. Be saved. And they probably reject him because, look, it only says seven others, him and his seven member, the seven members of his family. And so God didn't spare them. He brought that flood, but he protected Noah he took care of him. So God, Peter's also giving examples of how God not only brought judgment, but took care of his people. And he does it again in the next example. Verse six, that of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it says burning them to ashes, completely wiping it clean, wiping it down. And he made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. The, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is from Genesis 19. Abraham is told by God that he is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham prays on behalf of the city and says, God, if there's 50 righteous, will you save it? And God says, yes, and, but, but Abraham knows that there's not 50 people righteous in that city. So he keeps whittling it down to 10. And God says he will spare them. But as we know from, the, from what happens next, God doesn't spare the city, and instead, he goes in, God pulls out Lot, sends angels to pull him out and rescues him, but that this is an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, that God is going to destroy, and he is going to hold them up as this example because this is what happens when people walk away and distance themselves from God, and not only do that, but go towards, he says, lawlessness, basically pursuing whatever pleasures they want and not without any regard to God's law whatsoever. And it becomes this horrible, awful wickedness that we see. 
And he says, if, in this verse 7, rescued Lot a righteous man, which I think is a funny or an interesting term that he calls Lot righteous, because if you read that story, not all of his activities are righteous. But Peter gives us a clue as to why this is, because it's, he says that Lot was distressed by the depraved conduct around him, that he was a righteous man and that he was tormented in his righteous soul by what he saw and what he heard. And so none of us have been in the situation, as far as I know, or none of us have been in a situation where we are, or our life is at stake and we, might ha- we have to make decisions in the heat of the moment that could be bad. But because of the fact that God comes in and rescues Lot out of that situation that tells us that God had something in mind and knew the heart of Lot and wanted to pull him out and not destroy him. And so when we see this, this is where we kind of get our, our second fact, is that a false teacher's judgment is coming since God has done it before. The whole point of this passage is that he is pointing to these three examples, kind of giving a complete picture that, yes, even though God may have waited for a time and Noah and Lot had to be patient to wait for God to move and they were surrounded by the wickedness and the lawlessness that was disturbing them, that was distressing them, that God eventually did bring the, that judgment on these people. And so he's saying that that same thing, Peter is saying that the same thing is gonna happen to these false teachers, that judgment will come upon them. And when we look at these passages, we might start to get to a place where we say, man, this makes God sound really angry. And yes, God is angry at sin, at wickedness, because it distorts and distracts and takes people away from the truth. And again, we need to look through God's judgment and justice through the cross that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, took our sins in our place to some, a death that we deserved to live He took that for us so that when we put our faith in him, we would have new life in him. That is God's view, ultimate view of judgment. So when we think about this, here's how we should respond. First of all, we need to pray. I think we underestimate the power of prayer sometimes. We need to pray first that the gospel would be unhindered, that even though there are people who are saying they're Christians and they are doing things that are not very Christ-like, that that would not hinder the gospel and there would be people who would live it rightly that would reveal the true Jesus to people. We pray for the false teachers to repent because of the fact, and we'll see this in a couple weeks, that Peter says this in, in chapter three of this book, that he desires that all should come to repentance and that none should perish. So that should be our heart for every single person, even the most wicked of people and the, and the worst of false teachers. We don't look at this judgment as they're getting their due comeuppance and we should celebrate that fact. No, we should be praying for them to repent because this is what God desires. This is God's ultimate desire for those false teachers and that they would stop doing what they do and, and turn away from it. But then also that we pray for those who are uh, kind of stuck in the pattern of being a follower of one of these false teachers, that they would have the light switch would come on, they would realize what's going on, and they would find their way out and, and find the truth so that they could be rescued. But we also need to recognize we need to have love and compassion for those who are in these situations and that we also need to know and be able to defend the true gospel well and in a way that is gracious and loving. Let's continue, verse nine. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. So if this is so, all of these three examples that he has given, then it is obvious that God knows how to do how to do two very important things. First of all, to rescue the godly from trials. And what he means by this, those who are his, those are his people who have given their lives to him. He knows how to preserve them and keep them from falling away from him. When we talk about this idea of trials, it could be any external challenges to our faith that we might face in our world. So that could be temptation, that could be suffering, that could be doubt. Anything along those lines that is causing us a challenge to our faith, God wants to rescue us from them. Not in a sense that we would never, ever have to deal with them, that, they would, that, that this would be a different form of a prosperity gospel where we would be able to say, I never have any trouble in my life. That is simply not going to happen. But that God would rescue us and keep us from falling away from him. 
And that hidden within this idea is, this, uh, is kind of within the Lord's prayer where we pray and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. That very famous prayer. But the other thing that God knows how to do is to hold the righteous for punishment on the day of judgment. When Christ returns, God is going to take care of evil. And remember, this is a good and loving thing that God must do in order to care for his people. And he's paving the way for the future. But you have to think of it like this. You have to think of it uh, that God is making it available and keeping this evil and wickedness away so that people can be open to hearing who Jesus is. A prime example I give to our youth group frequently is if, if I'm walking down the street in Portland with my family and somebody attacks my family, would it be a right and smart thing for me to do is to simply look at that attacker in the face and say, hey, man, God just loves you. Can I just give you a hug instead of doing what you're doing? That would be, that would be foolish. Instead, I should protect my family and do what is necessary to make sure my family is safe. That's what God is doing here. And we have to look at it through that lens. And so he says, all of this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh. Again, this is a kind of a, a, a phrase of living lifestyles of just pursuing sexual sin as much as they wanted and that they despise authority, basically rejecting that Jesus has any authority o- over their lives and that they can live however they want. They don't need to submit to Christ even though that is the true posture of a Christian is one of submitting to the lordship of Jesus in everything of our lives. So this brings us to our last fact that God will protect his people from these false teachers so that they will not fall away. It's a promise that God has made absolutely certain to every single one of us that if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we know that he will hold on to us. I think this is one of the most firm truths that we can see in scripture is that God holds on to those who are his and he will not let go. You hear this in Joshua, be strong and courageous. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will not let you go. So if you fear that you could fall away from him, what you do is you say, you come before God and you say, God, hold on to me. Don't let me go. God, I don't wanna fall away. Show me what it is I need to do. And we saw from what Peter said that what we need to do is, first of all, we pursue God from the grace that he has given us. We obey from the grace he has given us. And so we pursue him with all of our lives. We don't, we're not lazy and we don't just wait for God to change us, but we pursue it. We go after it. And then we need to remember this idea that God holds on to us. I love this. There's this hymn I've been listening to a lot lately. It's, the hymn is called, He Will Hold Me Fast. And not fast as in like he's gonna hold me really quick and he's gonna be speedy, okay? And that's not what he means. What he means is fast as in firm and solid. He will hold me firm. Listen to this, listen to this verse. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. So even when we feel like our, our faith is failing, when we are failing to keep away sin from our lives, when we can't hold on to God, yes, he will hold on to us. He will never let us go. And for a reason, here's where it says in the chorus, here's the reason why. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast for my savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. Don't ever forget that. Even in the midst of all this talk I've been talking about, about judgment and wickedness and evil, that God's primary posture is one of love towards his creation, that he desires that all should come to repentance and that his love went so far to the point to be willing to die on the cross, to take, that, take our place on our behalf so that we could be in a right relationship with him. And then as a result, he has given us everything we need to follow him. So we don't need to worry about what is coming around us because God has given us what we need to reject and move away from these false teachers and to move past what they are trying to entice us with. So what do we do now that we know these things? Well, first of all, we need to pray. Lots and lots of prayer because that's where we recognize that we can't do this. God is gonna have to be the one that does it. Because people are being deceived, people are being led astray, and we want to see the gospel win. We want to see God's truth 
that Jesus paid the price for our sins when in this world and that you can, con- you can have a relationship with him and you can be saved. You can be made right with God if you put your faith in him. We want to see that win, but we need to remember this beautiful truth that God will hold us fast, that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, and that God is not going to abandon us and leave us here to continue to deal with the wickedness, but eventually he will come and return and bring this all to completion. So let's all remember from the beginning, what the main point of all of this was. That the false teacher's power comes from teaching what people want to hear and the deception of Satan, but God's judgment on them will come soon and God will keep his people from falling away from him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. We love you. We thank you that you have given your life for us so that you would pave the way and that we could know you even more. And Jesus, we pray We do pray for the people that are caught up in these false teachings, God, even the ones who are teaching it. God, we pray for them to come to a relationship with you, God, where they realize what they are doing. God, they would repent of their sin, turn away from it, and give their lives to you and devote themselves to you. So Jesus, as we continue our worship this morning, let this be about you and who you are and not about us. We love you and we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen.